tends to give us uh, rules and ideas and concepts without really rooting them in the Torah very much. Um, so it's already unusual to see references to biblical verses or Torah stud, uh, stories in the Mishnah um, at all. And then to see actual Midrash in the Mishnah is highly unusual. And the, the format and structure of this Midrash is also atypical of Midrash. Um, so I'm going to put it on the screen now. You can also find it uh, helpfully in Sidor Sim Shalom on page 275 because it comes from uh, Pirkei Avot, which appears in the Shabbat Sidor. Uh, so here it is. So this is uh, from the middle of chapter 5 of Pirkei Avot. Uh, the Mishnah tells us, Kol machloket shehi l'shem shamayim sofa lehitkayem, any dispute that is for the sake of heaven will, in the end, be sustained, but one that is not for the sake of heaven will not, in the end, be sustained. Um, and so they're just laying out, this is very typical Mishnah here, where they're simply laying out a principle to us in uh, very clear and short declarative language. Um, and then they're going to ask for examples to illustrate. So what would be a dispute for the sake of heaven? The dispute of Hillel and Shammai is the paradigmatic example of a dispute for the sake of heaven. V'she'ena l'shem shamayim. So, uh, and not for the sake of heaven, what's an example? What's the paradigmatic example of a dispute that is not for the sake of heaven? Machloket, uh, zo machloket korach v'chol adato. This is the dispute of Korach and his band. So I want to just uh, kind of offer an opportunity uh, for people to... Um, Actually, we're not going to do this. We're going to go to breakout rooms and we're going to come back. Um, and hopefully, if you're not already familiar with the characters of Hillel and Shammai, you had some time uh, before Shabbat to watch the, the charming video that we sent out. Um, but uh, in a moment, David's going to send us to breakout rooms. And um, David, set timers for seven minutes. Um, so we're going to go to the breakout rooms. Uh, the question that I would like people to consider in the breakout rooms, um, what do you see as the defining qualities of these two groups? So on the one hand, Hillel and Shammai, and on the other hand, uh, Korach and his gang. What are the defining qualities of these two groups that would lead the Mishnah to choose these two sets as paradigmatic examples of dispute that is or is not for the sake of heaven. Uh, if you had any insights into either the characters of Hillel and Shammai or the characters of Korach and his gang about um, like why of all of the examples in Jewish history up until the time of the Mishnah in the middle of the second century, like why these two as paradigms of uh, dispute for or not for the sake of heaven. Um, and feel free to just, uh, I guess, uh, just unmute yourself and, and pop in or use the raise hand button and I can call on you. But I know you have good things to say because I heard you in the breakout rooms. Go on, Annie. Why don't you uh, spill what we were talking about and you're muted. Okay, no, sure. I mean, I want to, I want to hear from, from others as well, but, but one thing we talked about is that, you know, in, with Hillel and Shammai, even though we often follow Hillel's positions, we preserve the minority opinion. We still pass on um, the stories of what Shammai thought. Um, so we talked about maybe a, 
controversy l'shem shemaim for the sake of heaven is that you're you're treating the other person with whom you disagree as though they too are made in the image of God, um, as though they too have have something of value to to offer the world. And sort of the the opposite of that we talked about today, right? We were talking about you know comments on Facebook or how often you know a civil discourse like that that we see sometimes online does not <laughs> come from that that perspective. Okay, good. So, right. So I think there's been, there's been a lot of, I've been hearing a lot of discourse about what people are calling cancel culture and this idea that, you know, if your ideas are, uh, are not the ideas that I hold, then you're dead to me. Um, and the way in which that devalues the other. But I think, uh, Rabbi Annie, what I hear you and Ginny saying is it's not just about avoiding devaluing the other, but there was actually between Hillel and Shammai uh, an active and explicit valuing of the other um, that that lifted up and elevated the status of the counterparty to say, you know, not only not only am I going to not tear you down, but I'm actually going to present you as uh, someone whose ideas are worthy of respect and consideration, even though I'm fiercely opposed to your viewpoint and I'm advancing a different viewpoint. I'm going to actively confer value onto your view as well. That's, that's really, that's a really important insight. Thank you. That's very much the view of the American judicial system, particularly with respect to, I mean, you see Supreme Court opinions and Court of Appeals opinions in which there's a majority and the majority wins. There's no question about that, but very valued is the dissent. And uh, as uh, lawyers, as Congress people, whatever government people involved, one often goes back to the dissents and very often the dissents become the law 30, 40 years later. But the respect for the system is encompassed by the fact, yeah, one side wins, but the other view um, institutionally has a great deal of respect. So there's a structural piece also in which the the honoring of the dissenting or minority view um, actually adds a measure of stability and durability to the system that allows it to be strong over a very long period of time. Enormously reinforcing. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, Rabbi Sue. So we were talking about the fact exactly that that there is something larger than the two people or the two parties in any vikuach, in any argument, um, that they're, that's, it's in the context of a larger system, which is exactly what Dan is referring to. And in terms of American law, it's the Constitution. It's the fact that we are all, that all of the parties and those who are making their very cogent arguments are doing it in a particular context. And that's exactly the situation for Hillel and Shammai. They are arguing L'Shem Shammayim because they are both in a context of believing they are rabbis in an ancient world who believed in the power and the, um, and the, they unquestionably um, embraced God's power um, as the maker of us all, as the creator of the universe, as the creator of each of them. And in that way, as Annie said, um, that everyone is created B'Tselem Elohim. And I was thinking about the fact that in our synagogues, we often will invite folks with opposing views, but we're doing it in the context of the synagogue. So when we're inviting people to BCBI to offer perhaps a, you know, two opposed, two people who are running for office um, locally, um, or two people who have very different views on an issue that we all care about, we're doing it in the context of our synagogue community. So in a way we're saying, this is a conversation, um, L'Shem Shemaim, because we are coming together here to honor each voice. But we used to be able to do that in the United States. You could disagree with someone and indeed argue with them without this vicious uh, conversation that seems to be going on most of the time. 
I mean, if we could do it then, why can't we do it now? Well, I would say, um, I didn't mean to cut you off, Rabbi. Can I, would I? No, no please. I would much rather hear oh, from you. Oh. All right. Um, that's, that's a minority viewpoint, but I appreciate it. Um, but um, the, um, I mean, part of this, though, is like, we always look, no one really believes in free speech kind of like as in a perfectly abstract view. Part of it, it it's intrinsically tied with what, how you assess the kind of people's substantive viewpoints. So like we all agree that like people should not face social stigma for, I don't know, wanting to have a unicameral legislature or something like that. That, that is kind of like within the reasonable bounds of um, discussion. And most of us would agree that say like, thinking Hitler was awesome and thinking the Holocaust was like a desirable outcome would be the kind of thing that would put you, which should subject you to severe social stigma. And I think what we're, you know, what we're navigating right now is a reassessment of what viewpoints people consider to be substantively offensive. And um, the things that, um, you know, we're, you know, we're going through this kind of national rethinking about race and equality and, you know, the bur who, who should have to tolerate different kinds of burdens. And I think part of, you know, what we're, you know, what we're going through is there are things that like have historically, like always been offensive to, to black people that we just haven't really cared about or haven't weighed the same way we would for, for other groups or, you know, in terms of gender and sex and things along those lines, things, you know, kind of portrayals of women um, as sex objects or as, you know, kind of inherently submissive or as purely, you know, just the, you watch, you know, a movie from 20, 30 years ago, there would be, um, you know, you would find very few non-romantic movies in which like a woman is the main character. Like that would be, it would just be our, be our conception of the world was that women were in supporting roles for men. And so, as we kind of go through this, this reassessment of, you know, the roles different groups have our, our society and their kind of claims to equal treatment and their claims to consideration for what we say, the particular views that are, you know, socially, you know, acceptable and not are, are shifting. And I, it's going to be, uh, to some extent, it's going to be a little bit of a messy process because, you know, if we move the center here, they're going to be people that were, you know, there are probably going to be things that get you know, canceled, if you will, that where it's probably not entirely fair, but because like, it's kind of a messy organic process, this shifting is going to change things. And so I think that, you know, we, we all like to talk about reason debate, but if I showed up in your house and I was like, why can't we discuss, have, have a reasonable historical analysis about how many people died in the Holocaust? Like, you know, why, why are you so close-minded that you like, you know, you, you know, you won't consider my alternative viewpoint. You would find that really offensive and correctly so. And so I just, I just think that part of what we're going through is we've always had views that are, you know, within the kind of mainstream discourse, outside the mainstream discourse. And we're kind of going through a social reawakening now or reconsideration of, of what falls in that and what, what doesn't. Yeah, one of, there was an article in last week's New York Times. It was like one of those articles that like starts on the front page and then you have to go to page like 94 for like the rest of the two pages of the article. Um, but it was about, uh, it, was a, it told the story of a church in Alabama um, whose pastor now is leaving, um, but who the controversy kind of began shortly after President Trump's election when uh, he gave a sermon in which he criticized the travel restrictions that came very early in the Trump administration. Um, but part of what struck me was like this now as this pastor is leaving for another church, he said about one of his main critics in the, in the church, um, who had been particularly critical about the pastor's liberal stance on LGBT issues, that um, he said he had a lot of sympathy for someone who the contours of the world had changed under his feet. Um, 
You know, and I was struck by the, the L'Shem Shemaim and the pastor's ability to see that in this other guy. Um, you know, I was, thinking about, it was a couple of years ago, was at a Shabbos meal where um, the subject of free to be you and me came up. Um, and I, and I turned to, I turned to a friend, a friend who was sitting next to me and, and sort of said something about, yeah, but it's so hetero and cis normative. And, and I remember them saying back to me, yeah, but we may be among the few people for whom free to be you and me is, reg is regressive at this point. Right, because you know, because of all of this stuff about like little girls grow up to be mommies and marry daddies who were little boys, and it's like, well, some little girls grow up to be men, and some mommies marry other mommies, and right, which was like not in 1972, like that wasn't the conversation. Um, you know, and and yet my my children, I, they haven't really commented on it so much, but it, it's um. I don't know, I just think about that. Like there are these artifacts, or we can go back further. We have, um, we leave it in the car for road trips, but we have the like complete 2000 year old man box set. So it's like the Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner comedy records from the sixties. And Rebecca's constantly hitting skip every time F-A-G is the punchline to a joke. Right, and like, and I, and, and, and I honestly don't think there was anything mean spirited about it. it you know, it was, and yet it was like, it wasn't, um, it wasn't like they wanted to hurt people. It was, I think as Brian was saying that the harm that was caused by those kinds of jokes was invisible to them at the time, right? And so now we're like, you know, like, like hitting, like vigorously hitting skip every time there's a cringe joke that comes up on, on these records from 50 plus years ago. Um, and, and that's, and that's a reality that we have to face. I, I, I want to hold that together with a question of whether we need to, you know, cancel and boycott everyone who hasn't quite gotten as woke as the wokest of us. Um, but the conversations are shifting. Gary, I saw your hand. But you have to unmute before we can hear you. I'm woke to technology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. technology yeah. is not my thing. Uh, actually, yesterday, the official line about on free to be me and you of boys grow up to be daddies and girls grow up to be mommies has been changed. They've rewritten the song. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so the people who wrote it, that is Marla Thomas and her Marla Thomas and realizes her group, it doesn't fit today. Got it changed this week. Right, but of course, how many copies of that record are in circulation? All right. Uh, about 20 million. Right. <laughs> so, it's, so, so that's part of the challenge. Um, but I wanna, we haven't talked about Korach very much. Um, and I just want to be mindful that, um, that he is the ostensible subject of this week's parasha. Um, so what it, so, so tell me well, some- He, he was being self, I mean, he was being selfish. And that's, he was only looking at his group, not the whole of the, of the people. Uh, and Sh uh, Hillel and Shammai were in, whether you agree with them or not, we're trying to look out for everybody. And I don't know if that's what we're talking about, but that's the thought I had. Well, we're talking about it now. So, okay. so the first thing that Gary is going to bring up is um, this question of whether, uh, of Korach being very self-interested and was yes. focused on his own um, goals and his own prestige, in contrast to what Rabbi Annie and Ginny were sharing earlier about Hillel and Shammai, that there was, there was a something else that was the point for them, right? There was, um, there was this, this project of Torah study and their disputes, even though they were disagreeing on the details, they were agreed in that the purpose was to advance the project of deepening understanding of Torah. Um, and that wasn't about either of them per se, that was about a bigger something. Um, you know, again, if you think about, um, you know, we think about in, um, you know, analogy to a country, right? Um, there could be politicians uh, who say, 
my project is public service and I'll work with anybody from any party who's going to get my con my constituents the things that my constituents need. And if that means reaching across the aisle to make a deal that's going to benefit my constituents, I'll work with those people. And if that means working with these people, I'll work with these people because what I'm involved in is helping the people who elected me have better lives. Um, and we know that there are other people who are, are looking at the poll numbers and are saying, you know, but what's going to get me another term? Um, and, and that, you know, I think is what um, Gary is saying by analogy is kind of a Korach question. Like, like what, what's going to poll well to get me elected to another term is more of a Korach question. Um, and I want to just kind of mention, uh, and you may have seen it in the footnotes in the Eitz Chaim, but there's a verse much later on during a, a census of the Israelites that says, Uvnei Korach lo metu, that the sons of Korach did not die. Um, and um, Shayo Leibovitch reads this as saying the, the sons of Korach, the mentality that's displayed by Korach persists in every generation. Right? And so it's not, it's not far-fetched to say, are there examples of leaders in our world who exhibit these kinds of behaviors? Uh, Rabbi Sue, you're still on mute. Thank you. Uh, Rabbi Rachel Cowan, Zichron Alavracha, wrote a really beautiful piece in the Torah, a women's commentary about Parashat Korach. And she built on that verse, um, but she says it's Korach in each of us, that each of us has both Korach and Moshe. So in, she's, without being explicit about it, she's also looking back at the Mishnah and saying, at times, I am in a vikuach that's b'shem shamayim, um, l'shem shamayim, and other times, I too am korach, when I'm fearful, when my own ego overwhelms me. And so she asks by saying, and one of the lines that I love about her piece is she says, when I'm in a korach place, I get caught up in the tragedy of Rachel. And I think that often that happens to all of us. I get caught up in the tragedy of Sue and I forget to see that, wait, I'm part of a much bigger story here. And so this Parsha is particularly challenging, I think, for all of us. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for, for bringing Rabbi Rachel's, like um, for, for invoking her here and for bringing that beautiful idea of like the tragedy of myself. Susan? Yeah, it just also occurred to me that rather than picture it as that Korach is the symbol, in the, in the actual story story, it's possible that his sons did not have the same feelings that he did. Mm -hmm. And it also, in that, if you look at it that way, shows that just because the, the sins of the father it can go on for many generations. It also means that within your own generation, you can um, have different concepts of, of the world and, and what's right and what's wrong. And uh, you can then change the future. Yeah, one of the other commentaries on that verse later on points out that shortly before that in the census, we also see that Datan and Aviram have a brother Mm -hmm. who yeah. seems not to be mixed up in their mess here, right? And so, so there is this sense, and the, and the, Torah, the Torah struggles with this, um, right? Because we also get the verse that says the, you know, the father sins and the son's teeth are set on edge. I think the Torah struggles with how do we transcend our context and how do we transcend our upbringing? Um, but certainly what you're pointing out is a very strong message in the Torah that says we're not, we're not born into our destiny. And there are opportunities for each of us to choose how we're going to live out the, um, the circumstances that we encounter. Uh, yeah, Jenny.
we go. I'm not so hot on technology either. Um, I was wondering about whether Korach and everybody else had an opportunity to realize that it wasn't Moshe, that it was Adonai. And in fact, uh, let's see, page 864 in the Chumash, <coughs> Moses says to them, by this you shall know that it was the Lord who sent me to do all these things that they are not of my own devising. So he is pointing out, you're not standing up against me, you're standing up against God. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't say that Korach was there. It only says the Tanan of Iran, but in any event, uh, so maybe if they really didn't die, maybe they did grasp that it wasn't Moshe self-aggrandizing. Any rate. Right, good. So there are also opportunities to see, um, like what I'll say is, um, like the underpinnings of tshuva in here, these kind of questions of, of what becomes of people who make poor choices and where are the opportunities to rectify those choices. Uh, Rabbi Annie, did you have a hand up? I was just thinking about it. Some of us have been studying Psalms together um, the past few weeks, and a few of the Psalms are attributed to B'nai Korach. So whoever wrote the, the poems, the Psalms um, said, you know, these are tied in some way to the children of Korach who ended up having a role bringing music and bringing art, right, in the, in the sacred service. So there's um, a, a commentary that says that they actually did get swallowed up and somehow like lived in, in Gehenna, they lived in the underworld and came back at some point. Um, so I've been thinking about them this week as sort of like a, a spiritual underground, you know, thinking of artists as well and the voice of artists that somehow times lift up things in our society that, um, you know, maybe others aren't ready to hear yet, um, but then later on are ready to hear. But so I, I've been thinking about that idea too, or the children, somehow this spiritual underground um, that their voices emerge at the right moment to speak truths um, that do need to be heard. Um. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking about, um, as you were talking about that, thinking about the difference between philosophy and art. Um, and the way in which, um, you know, if we're going to really generalize um, in a broad way, um, art is at least comfortable with, if not striving to be messy in a way that philosophy strives to be ordered and neat. Um, and I think sometimes about something that um, Rabbi Pinchas Giller, who was one of my teachers in rabbinical school, sort of said to us one time, um, he said, and this is, you know, somebody who spent his career uh, as an academic, he got a PhD in Jewish mysticism, and he teaches in a rabbinical school, and he said one time that, that um, rabbis in academic positions should stay out of moral questions, um, because unlike the congregational rabbis, they're not face-to-face -face with the consequences of the, of the positions that they take. Um, you know, and, and, and I was thinking about it in, in Chicago, where there were, you know, attention that you have to face. And like, what do you do when there's a fair housing initiative and the developers being targeted are members of the congregation, right? And, and to what extent do you join in the movement? And to what extent do you say, look, we can't sign this petition. We're going to do what we can behind the scenes. Um, because there's a relationship there that's broader than the one issue. Um, and, you know, it's something that I've, I keep coming back to because it's very much on my mind is, is the, I, I have a lot of fear that comes up around ideological purity. Um, you know, cause I think about, um, 
you know, I, I mean, it's, you know, I'm just going to say it, right? Like Hitler had a lot of ideological clarity. Stalin had a lot of ideological clarity. Um, and, and historically, our country, you know, if we want to go back to a time in this country where we didn't have quite so much trouble talking to one another about things, uh, we also didn't have quite so much ideological clarity. Um, you know, the, the positions were not as well defined and the battle lines were not drawn as thickly. And um, I, I think there's really something for us to consider there about what it means to live in that, in that mess that is art and life. Um, you know, it, instead of trying to have the, the purity and the clarity of philosophy, philosophy has its place, but it's hard to live in a philosophy. Um, I want to, I'm going to put the Mishnah back up on the screen for a moment because I want to just highlight one thing because um, there's a grammatical problem here um, that's very subtle, but I just wanted everyone to notice. Um, so what would be a dispute for the sake of heaven? What's an example of a dispute for the sake of heaven? The dispute of Hillel and Shammai. And what's an example of a dispute that is not for the sake of heaven? The dispute of Korach and his band. So what's the grammatical problem there? In one, the dispute is between uh, two opposing views. In the other, uh, it's all of Israel, I suppose, with Korach and his band, because they're not disputing each other. Excellent, Steve. So, so in fact, there is a commentary that suggests that this is very deliberate on the part of the Mishnah, to tell us that in this machloket she'en l'shem shemayim, in the dispute that is not for the sake of heaven, the factions are divided against themselves. But that, that, that even within Korach and his gang, they were not in agreement. Um, and what the commentaries point to is that there are actually three different disputes going on here. Um, you have Korah, who, um, as a number of you have said, was challenging Moshe's authority and wanting the authority for himself um, and sort of saying, you know, why do you get to be in charge? I want to be in charge. Um, not out of any kind of principle of Moshe doing a good job or a bad job, but of wanting more for himself. Um, you have Tatan and Aviram, who are, are basically nihilists, um, who just want to make trouble for the sake of making trouble. Um, and you have this figure of On Ben Pellet, who's a, a, a very strange figure. And I've shared before um, a midrash in which On Ben Pellet goes home and his wife says to him, um, like, why do you even need this problem, right? Like, what difference does it make to you if Moshe's the boss or if Korach's the boss? Like what you're making trouble for yourself that you don't need. And she basically talks him out of it, um, right? Because he disappears from the story. If you go back and reread the parasha, he's mentioned in the beginning as being part of the dispute. And then he disappears from the story entirely. And so the Midrash says, uh, his wife talked him out of it. Um, always listen to your spouse. They generally will keep you out of trouble. Um, his own's wife talks him out of it. She gets him out of the, ga the game and he leaves it alone. Um, but there are also commentaries that explore, like, what is the issue of the B'nai Ruvain? Like, what was On Ben Pellet upset about? And they bring forward a third thing, which was about, um, if you go back, let's say, before Sefer Vayikra, before the real establishment of the Kohanim and Levi'im, the chiefs of the tribes would offer sacrifices. And he's upset about the loss of his privilege. He's upset about the displacement of what he used to enjoy uh, in favor of another group that he sees as less significant than himself. Ruvain, remember, is the firstborn, right? And so there's a lot of pride in the tribe of Ruvain of being the first and being the most important. And we can see all three of these today. 
I mean, there are those political leaders whose core concern always is how to shore up and increase their own power. Um, and they'll do whatever they need to do, never mind the cost on people and never mind the cost on our systems of government. Uh, but they'll do whatever they have to do to keep themselves where they want to be. That's Korach. Right. Um, and there are people who are, are simply spiteful. I'm just thinking about this, right? Tatan and Aviram are internet trolls, basically. I mean, without the internet, but they're basically internet trolls, all right? They want to, they're nasty for the sake of being nasty. Um, and they're not trying to achieve anything. They just want to wreck anything that feels to them like it's better than they are. Um, and when I think about on Ben Pellet, I think about like what it means in our society to live in a country that for centuries was built on and sustained by white supremacy. Um, what it means to be white in a time when that is breaking down. Um, and, and I think that many of us are happy to see that breaking down and want to see the lifting up of black lives and want to see the lifting up of diversity. And as Rabbi Sue was talking about when we just came back from the breakout rooms, would like to see the country more live up to the promises that our founding fathers made. Um, and I think about what the pastor said about his congregants. There's a lot of displacement in that. Um, and, and for me, I would say the biggest hope that I take away from this parasha is that of the three, um, it's own Ben Pellet. It's the person who is upset about the displacement of his privilege who is able to transcend that and make his peace and go forward as a part of the community. The, the craven political opportunists and the internet trolls, um, I, I'm not sorry to see them swallowed up by the earth. Um, but I do have a lot of sympathy for the people who were raised in a world whose rules don't apply anymore um, and I'm and I'm hopeful reading this week's parasha that they, like their biblical forebear on Ben Pellet, will grow into a new understanding. You want to say that out loud or no? I was, uh, you know, so, some of us have these experiences with our parents. You could tell the story about the the story about what? The, oh yeah, <laughs> Rebecca's parents called us during the uh, during the rioting that was happening, and he was asking what was going on, and you know, and she said it's like not really happening in our neighborhood. He says, "Just keep the door locked." He said, "That's you know, a certain I don't know." Was that? Oh okay, all right. Well, uh, at any rate. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there are, there are opportunities here. Um, and as I said, I'm hopeful that, um, that we'll see change and that we'll see growth um, among the people who are really good at heart, even if sometimes the things that come out of their mouths are uncomfortable for us. Um, and with that, so with that in my heart, um, we're going to turn to page 148, and I want to invite everyone to join me in the prayer for our country that's at the bottom of page 148. Our God and God of our ancestors, we ask your blessings for our country, for its government, for its leaders and advisors, and for all who exercise just and rightful authority. Teach them insights from your Torah that they may administer all affairs of state fairly, that peace and security, happiness and prosperity, justice and freedom may forever abide in our midst. Creator of all flesh, bless all the inhabitants of our country with your spirit. May citizens of all races and creeds forge a common bond in true harmony 
to banish hatred and bigotry and to safeguard the ideals and free institutions that are the pride and glory of our country. May this land under your providence be an influence for good throughout the world, uniting all people in peace and freedom, helping them to fulfill the vision of your prophet. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they experience war anymore. And let us say, Amen. Um, we'll turn in a moment to the prayer for the state of Israel, which Rabbi Annie will sing for us. Um, but I want to just highlight for everyone, uh, as this is also a time of great importance and a challenging juncture in Israel with talk of annexation and a lot of complex feelings that that raises for the American Jewish community and within Israel, uh, that this Tuesday we will welcome Ambassador Dennis Ross, who's going to be uh, joining us online to uh, speak uh, about the impact of COVID-19 in the Middle East, uh, but also now about uh, the Israeli government's uh, proposals around annexation, uh, what this means for the Middle East, what this means for the prospects of peace, what this means for political relationships with the United States and for the relations between Jews in our country and Jews in Israel. Uh, Ambassador Ross is the author of five books on the Middle East and international relations and was uh, personally involved in shaping the U.S.'s involvement in the peace process through Republican and Democratic administrations. And it's a, an incredible privilege to welcome Ambassador Dennis Ross back to BZBI. And uh, I hope after Shabbat, you'll take the opportunity to look at the BZBI website and to register for Ambassador Ross's talk on Tuesday. We'll now turn to page 149 for the prayer for the State of Israel. <clears throat> 